Tonight we continue our study through the Bible as we are currently in the book of Job. And tonight we'll be looking at chapters 18 through 21 as Job continues in his discourse and debate with his friends. This morning we'd like to look more carefully at the 19th chapter of Job as he is responding to his friend Bildad and to the accusations that Bildad has made concerning him. Basically, Bildad repeats the same kind of thing that Obviously, there is something wrong in Job's life. No man would suffer as Job suffered unless he had done some violent thing against God, either in his heart or overtly. Uh, surely, Job is guilty before God, and the fact that he protests and declares he is innocent only increases his guilt. He uses a lot of Oriental proverbs in trying to prove his points. And as Job responds to him, Job again protests of his own innocence, but then he begins to tell of the horrible misery that he experiences, how he feels sort of all alone, no one on earth standing with him, been forsaken by his friends, by his family, And yet, out of the midst of the darkness, out of the midst of Job's despair, he makes a tremendous declaration of faith. Remarkable because of the time in which this declaration was made. Let's look at verse 23 beginning there, and see this declaration of faith that was made by Job. He said, Oh, that my words were now written. Oh, that they were printed in a book. I wonder about this. You know, they were written and printed in a book ultimately. And here we are reading this book that has Job's words printed. But it's more or less saying, you know, a lot of things I don't know, a lot of things I don't understand, but listen, this is what is solid, this is what is real, and I wish that this could just be placed somewhere permanently. In fact, he goes on to say that they were graven with an iron pen and lead in a rock, that they might last forever. I know, these are the words he wants permanently to be engraved somewhere. I know that my Redeemer liveth, and that he shall stand at the latter day upon the earth. And though after my skin the worms destroy this body, yet in my flesh I shall see God whom I shall see for myself, and my eyes shall behold, and not another, though my reins be consumed within me. A marvelous, powerful declaration of what I know. I know that my Redeemer lives. Now, there are a lot of things that Job did not know. He did not know why he had been stripped of everything. He did not know why he was in this miserable condition. He did not know why he had to suffer all of this pain. These were the questions that were troubling him. Why has God allowed this to happen to me? Why has God allowed me to lose all of my possessions, my family, my children? Why has God allowed me to lose my own health and to go through all of these miseries? I don't know, I don't know. 
but this is what I do know. And he comes out with this strong declaration of what I know. There are a lot of things in life that we cannot and will not know. A lot of problems, a lot of pain, a lot of suffering. We seek to find the answers, the reasons, but we just many times just cannot know. There are things that happen, and when I go to talk to a person to counsel and to comfort them, I, I don't try to say, well, maybe this or maybe that. I often just confess we don't know why these kind of things happen. But what we do know is important. And never let go of what you do know because of something you don't know. And so Job was holding on to what he did know. A lot of things I don't know right now, but this I do know, and this is what I'm holding on to. I know that my Redeemer lives. The word Redeemer there in Hebrew is an interesting word. It's the word goel. And that word is a word that stood for someone who was closest and dearest to you, the one who was the closest and dearest to you in the world, the one who would stand for you in the day of calamity or trouble, the one who would stand by your side to be of support and to be a defense for you. If you could not pay a debt and you were taken to court, in those days you would be sold as a slave in order that the debt might be paid. But the goel, your goel, would be the one who would come and pay your debt so that you could be freed from slavery. The goel. If you mortgaged your house and couldn't make the payments and your house was in foreclosure, you were about to lose it, your goel would come and pay off the mortgage in order that you might be able to preserve your possession. The goel was one who stood by you, stood for you, the one who took care, if necessary, of your obligation. He was your redeemer, the goel. Now, Job declares, I know that my goel, my redeemer, lives. And that he's going to stand in the latter days upon this earth. It would seem that Job at this point was pretty much standing alone. As we go back in the chapter, verse 13, Job declares, He has put my brothers far from me, and my acquaintance are estranged from me. My friends have turned on me. He went on to say, verse 14, Even my family have failed, and my familiar friends or my close friends have forgotten me. Verse 15, he complains that even those that live in my house, my maids, my servants, they count me as a stranger. I am an alien in their sight. I call for my servants and they ignore me. Even his servants did not respect him anymore. And even his wife had turned on him, for he said that my breath is strange to my wife and though I entreated for the children's sake of my own body. My children have all been killed. My wife has turned against me. She wouldn't listen even though I begged her because even for our children's sake. And it would seem like every earthly support was taken away from this man. He was left alone. 
But yet not alone. I know that my Redeemer, that one who stands with me and that one who stands for me, I know he lives and he shall stand in the latter day upon the earth. Job believed that his Goel lived. That in the last days his Redeemer would stand upon the earth and even though his body returned to the dust, yet in his flesh he said, I shall see God. Now Job believed all of these things without the benefit of the New Testament revelation. That's what makes it so amazing. For us to declare our knowledge of these things, we have the benefit of the New Testament. We know that our Redeemer lives. In fact, the scripture says, seeing that he ever lives to make intercession for us. Paul writing to the church in Rome said, who is he that condemneth? It is Christ who has died, yea, rather, is risen again and is even at the right hand of the Father making intercession for us. Now, Job was going under a lot of condemnation. I mean, his friends, that's their whole thing was condemning him. They were certain that Job was an exceedingly sinful man, that he was a hypocrite, that he had done some horrible, vile thing because no one would suffer all that Job had suffered unless he was totally evil. And they were accusing Job of these things, of being an evil, vile person. And it was uh, constant condemnation from his friends. And yet Job said, hey, there's one that stands with me. You may have forsaken me. You may turn on me, but I know that my Redeemer lives. My Goel, the one who stands for me and with me, he lives. Well, we know that now concerning Jesus. Paul said, who is he that condemneth? It is Christ who has died, yea, res rather is risen again, even at the right hand of the Father making intercession. In the previous chapter that Job spoke in, which was back to chapter 17, Job there declared, the one who vouches for me is in heaven, or my advocate is in heaven the one who is vouching for me. And somehow Job knew this without the benefit of the New Testament revelation, something that God just revealed to his heart. He not only knew that his Redeemer lived, but that he was going to stand on the earth in the last days. Now again, in the New Testament, we are told that Jesus is coming again. We are told that when Christ, who is our life, shall appear, we shall also appear with him in glory. And that he shall live and reign upon the earth for a thousand years, and we shall live and reign with him. Job somehow knew this without the revelation of the New Testament. He knew it by faith. My Redeemer lives and in the latter days is going to stand upon this earth. And he knew about the resurrection, though this body goes back to the dust. Or though after my skin the worms eat my body, yet in my flesh I shall see God. And he had this glorious hope of one day seeing his Lord here upon the earth, standing upon the earth and establishing the righteous kingdom of God over the earth. In our text here, we see the relationship, we see the triumph of faith, but we see the relationship of this faith to patience. When I was in Sunday school, the characteristic of Job that was always emphasized was that of patience. When the teacher would ask the question, who is the most patient man who ever lived? I know, I know, Job, right. And, and that's the characteristic of Job that has always been 
brought out. He was a patient man. He endured all of these afflictions. But the secret of patience is faith. For patience is actually just an outgrowth of faith. It is because of what Job believed that he was able then to patiently endure all of the sufferings and all of the things that he experienced that he did not understand. What is it that Job believed that caused him to have such great patience? First of all, Job believed that God was in control of all of the circumstances that came into his life. When he had received word of the loss of his cattle and his sheep and his possessions, when he received word that even his children, all ten of them, were killed in that whirlwind that destroyed their house, he fell on his face and worshiped God and said, Naked I came into the world, naked I'm going out. The Lord has given and the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. He was confident that God was in control of every circumstance that affected his life. It was the Lord who gave, it is the Lord who has taken away. God controls and is in control of my circumstances, whether they seem to be of benefit or of pain, God is there and God controls. Nothing happens to me but what God has not allowed it to happen. And so he believed in this awesome sovereignty of God over his creation. When his wife saw his miserable condition and couldn't take it anymore and suggested to him, Job, why don't you just curse God and die? Get it over with. Job said, shall not we receive good and evil from the hand of the Lord? And again he saw that God was in control of those things that I have. Whether they be good or evil, the Lord is in control. And he recognized and believed that God controlled the circumstances of his life. Secondly, he believed that there was one who was standing for him in heaven. He who vouches for me is in heaven, back in chapter 16, verse 19. The word my witness is in heaven is in the Hebrew. The one who vouches for me is in heaven. His friends had turned against him and were condemning him and accusing him of all kinds of heinous sins. His wife had turned against him. His servants had turned against him. And yet he knew that there was one who was standing for him. One who was taking up his cause. In the New Testament, Paul asked the question, and if God be for us, who can be against us? And somehow Job knew that in all of these things, God was for him. My Goel lives, my Redeemer lives, I know this. I know that he's in control. Then the one who vouches for me, he is in heaven. And though I cannot explain or understand why I am going through the suffering and the pain and the loss of these things, I know somehow that God is for me. So that whatever has happened has happened for some good purpose of God. Whatever that may be, I don't know what it is. And that was Job's big complaint is, I don't know why these things are happening. 
Lord, if you would only reveal, if you'd only let me know, what is the purpose of these things? But he understood that God was in control and that God was for him. And he also knew that the day would come when there would be an understanding of all these things. In the last days, he's going to stand upon the earth and, hey, I may be wiped out, but yet I'm going to see God. I know there's a, there's a day of reckoning that will come when, when there will be the understanding. I, I know that when it all works out, when the whole thing is over, that we're going to be able then to, to see and there will be the understanding of these things. Maybe not now. It may never happen in my lifetime, but I know that one day that which is such a mystery to me now will be made clear and I will understand. And so these are the things that he believed that caused him to triumph over his circumstances. These were those utterances of faith that were, were flashes of light in the darkness of his whole grim experience of life. I know my Goel lives, my Redeemer lives, and shall stand in the latter days upon the earth. And that was the strength that gave Job the patience to endure these things that he went through. Now, I think that all of us realize that we need more patience. I know I do. Maybe I'm just, maybe I'm unique. In, I know I need more patience. I know that, as far as I'm concerned, one of the greatest things ever invented was five-second glue. <laughs> I hate to wait for glue to dry. However, I've found a problem with five-second glue. It really doesn't work in five seconds unless it's between your fingers. <laughs> Man, it's five seconds and they're bonded, I mean. but. There are, there are things where I'm, you know, I, I'm a man of action. I, let's go. Let's do it. You know, and, and to wait, I find difficult. I think one of the hardest scriptures that I have to fulfill is wait on the Lord. I don't want to wait on the Lord. I want to see it done now. Need patience. And someone said, well, yes, I, I need patience. I've been praying for patience, but boy, the whole roof it caved in. I mean, it, ooh. And then I read the scripture that tribulation works patience, and I quit praying for patience. <laughs> <laughs> Didn't want the tribulation. It's a, a misunderstanding of what that verse actually says. It doesn't say that tribulation creates or makes patience. Tribulation can make a wreck out of you. It makes your patience work, or it puts your patience to work. It worketh patience. It really puts it to the test. The tribulation is what puts the patience to the test. It is faith that makes patience. It's my faith and confidence in God that causes me to be able to wait upon the purposes of God to be fulfilled. And so really, rather than praying for patience, you probably should just pray for faith. Lord, increase my faith that I might truly understand that I have one who stands for me in heaven my Redeemer lives. And God, you're in control of the circumstances of my life. And though I cannot and do not understand why the pain and the suffering that I am experiencing, yet I know, God, that you're going to work things out for your eternal purposes and your eternal plan. 
And it may be that I'm going through a time of pain and weakness, but I know, Lord, that it's only that I might be strong. What if you were having constant pains in the abdominal regions of your body? So because they persisted, you finally went to the doctor and he began to probe and he pushes it. That hurt? Oh, yeah. Oh, ooh. And you push over this side. Oh, yeah. yeah. Oh, that sounds like appendicitis. Better take a blood count here. And he takes a sample of your blood, sends it to the lab, and, and he gets it back. He comes back and he says, oh, yeah, this blood count's pretty high. We... It indicates appendicitis. We better go in and take that thing out. Oh, but, you know, I, I don't know if I... Like, you're going to have to cut me, aren't you? And it's gonna, There's going to be blood. And, and, ooh, I don't want to be cut on, I don't think. And, and I'll have to be in bed for a few days and I'm going to be weak and won't be able to play golf tomorrow. And oh, I don't know if I want this or not. Well, I'll tell you what the alternative is. If... If that appendix should burst, then the poison will go through your system, peritonitis will set in, and, and that'll be it. You mean I could die? Yes, so oh, you bet you can die. Well, how soon before I can play golf? Well, a couple of weeks. <laughs> you mean I'll be strong and healthy again? Yeah, you'll be strong and healthy again. And so you go through the pain and the weakness of an operation in order that you might recover and be strong and resume normal activities. If that appendix remains in there, it can destroy you, it can kill you. You've got to get rid of it. And so there are other things in our lives in a spiritual sense that can destroy us and kill us. And God sees fit to remove these things. We say, oh, Lord, that hurts. Oh, no, 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 don't do that. that you got to cut? You got to cut that out? No, Lord, you know. I, if you don't, it can destroy you. And so God allows us those times of weakness, those times of pain, as he is cutting away from us those things that would destroy. Now, Job came to the understanding of God's plan and God's working in his life, that God is working out a purpose that I don't understand now, but someday my Redeemer is going to stand on the earth and he is standing for me now. You don't understand it either, and you're making all kinds of accusations. You have all kinds of ideas and... and uh, You've been condemning me, but there's one who is standing for me. There's one who's paid the price. And oh, how thankful we are that we can say, I know my Redeemer lives. Hey, I owed a debt I could not pay. And I was condemned. I was sold into slavery and condemned to be a slave in order that my debt might be fulfilled. But my Redeemer paid my debt. He set me free from the bondage of sin. I know my Redeemer lives. And he stands in my stead. He is there making intercession for me. And one day he's going to stand upon the earth. And I'm going to be standing here with him in the glories of his kingdom. And I know that even though I may die and my body be cremated or buried or whatever, yet I am going to see God. And I'm going to dwell with him because my Redeemer lives. And thus I can endure this world and all of the things that I don't understand, the horrible crimes of child abuse and other types of assaults that I cannot understand. Uh, our little grandson had stayed for a while with us and we had had such an enjoyable time, you know, you just, you want your house to be the magic kingdom. 
And my wife is so adept at making the, the magical atmosphere around the house with all the candies here and there. And I mean, all this kind of stuff that's not good, but you only have them for a few days, so, you know. <laughs> you want them just to feel it's magic land at Grandma and Grandpa's. And so our little grandson had been with us for a few days, and it was the magic kingdom. But the time came when he had to go home. And he came to me and he sat down for a grandfatherly grandson talk. He says, Grandpa, I don't want to go home. <laughs> and I said, but William, we've had a great time, but honey, the time has come. You've got to go home. He said, no, Grandpa, I don't want to go home. I want to stay with you. And of course, that's what you want to hear them say anyhow. <laughs> He said, Grandpa, it's awfully rough living at home. <laughs> and I find it's awfully rough living here. And I don't understand. But I do know that the present sufferings are not worthy to be compared with the glory that shall be revealed. I know my Redeemer lives. He stands for me. And I will stand with him one day. Shall we pray? Father, how thankful we are for the triumph of faith that brings us the glorious victory in the midst of the darkest night. And we see Job, Lord, just enveloped by that darkness. And yet we hear his cry, the cry of a heart that trusts in God in spite of the circumstances. Lord, teach us to have that kind of trust in you that trust that will help us to patiently endure the dark night as we wait for the new day to dawn, the day of your glorious kingdom. In Jesus' name we ask it. Amen. Shall we stand? The things that I have been saying are basically said for the child of God. The one who has come to trust in Jesus Christ is his Redeemer. You can know that God is in control of all of the circumstances and that he is working out a good purpose for all things work together for good to those who love God and are called according to his purpose. Now, if Christ isn't your Savior then it's probably over. I mean, all these horrible things that are happening, man, that's probably the end. I mean, you have no hope, no comfort, nothing to look forward to. It's only going to get worse. That's why it's so important to know that your Redeemer lives, to have received Jesus Christ as the Lord of your life, his redemption, for the Bible says we are redeemed not with corruptible things such as silver and gold from that empty life that we once lived, but with the precious blood of Jesus Christ. My Redeemer lives. He paid my price to redeem me and to redeem you. And I would encourage you to receive Jesus Christ as your Redeemer, your Lord and Savior. And if you're wise, you'll do it before you go home. May the Lord be with you. May the Lord bless you. May he keep his hand upon you. May he guide you. Watch over you. Fill you with his love. Strengthen you for our pilgrimage through this dark land until the glorious day come when we stand with our Redeemer in the new age, in the new kingdom the kingdom of God.
God bless you.